Hello friends! Welcome back to my channel and welcome to another reading vlog. This is not a week-long one. I don't actually know what this is going to be, but it is actually currently Friday. Um, it is almost the end of my work day. Not really, but I thought I would do a check-in and just kick off the weekend. Um, but it is Mid-Autumn Festival weekend, so tomorrow, September 10th, is Mid-Autumn Festival. Um, I originally, in my head, really wanted to do like a Mid-Autumn Festival book recommendations list because I have like a number of books that I feel like are perfect for Mid-Autumn Festival, especially the ones that surround Chang'e and Ho Yi. If you didn't know, Chang'e and Ho Yi is like the Mid-Autumn Festival mythology because Chang'e obviously is the goddess of the moon. And so a lot of um, mythologies that we were told growing up about this festival surrounded Chang'e and all the different... So like, I don't know if people know this, but Chang'e and Ho Yi have like different variations to the story. Um, so fundamentally, Chang'e and Ho Yi are like star-crossed lovers like that's their whole thing but there are various different interpretations and like versions of how they got separated and how um Chang'e ended up on the moon um so it's very interesting and I feel like Chang'e has kind of like made a made a not a comeback because I don't think she ever came to the west but I feel like she's like coming onto the scene in the west you know with Daughter of the Moon Goddess um with over the Moon, which was a film, obviously, but I feel like Over the Moon got like pretty good press when it came out. And then I think um, Emily XR Pan also wrote a Chang'e and Ho Yi retelling this year, Arrow to the Moon or something. Anyway, that was my plan originally to do like a recommendations video, uh, but obviously that didn't happen because life got the better of me, but maybe next year. But all that to say, I wanted to start this vlog today because I'm actually celebrating Mid-Autumn Festival one day early tonight with my family because tomorrow I'm actually going to a HarperCollins like event and it'll be my first bookish event ever like in person and I think that's so fun and I thought I would take you along with me maybe hopefully I don't know um but just to walk you through what I'm currently reading I just finished last night Speaking Bones and I did I finish the book or did it finish me unsure um I was up till like 3 a.m yesterday I finished the book at around 2 a.m and I was just like crying and then <laughs> I wasn't sleepy because I just cried and so I actually picked up um right after and read for a little bit Ruination by Anthony Reynolds I talked about this a little bit in my last reading vlog um and I'm about 135 pages in so I'm about a third of the way through the book. Um, I'm still really enjoying this. This is very much like a no thoughts plot only kind of like fun little like adventure fantasy. Um, and I feel like this is the kind of book that I really need right now because I just finished Speaking Bones. And like that is officially like my favorite series of all time. Like I, I hesitated to say that before because it wasn't complete. But like now that it's complete, I can like officially say it is like my favorite series ever. Um, and so because I know that nothing is going to top that, like there's just no way. I feel like anytime I finish like a super anticipated release like that, I just need to dive into like just fun books, fun books that I don't necessarily think are going to be five stars. They're all books that I think are going to be around like the three, four star mark. Um, and I just want to have a fun time. I don't really want to use my brain cells. I just want to enjoy what I'm reading. And I feel like Ruination is kind of perfect for that. Um, so I am going to be reading this. I really hope to finish it this weekend. I do find this book really easy to get through because like, I don't know if you can tell, probably not because the paper is so freaking white. I don't know who printed this, but like this paper is like white white but anyways what I was trying to say is that the font is massive and so like it flies by very quickly so that's what I'm mainly working on um I also am kind of in the mood to read like middle grade or YA maybe both because I feel like this year I haven't really read much of either to be honest I've read some middle grade and I feel like I've read a few YA and I don't know if it's just because there haven't been any like standouts in either category I just feel like this year has not been my year for YA or for, for middle grade and I just want to get back to it so I have a couple that are on my TBR that I think I might want to try um for middle grade I have Game of Stars by Sayantani Dasgupta this is the sequel to The Serpent's Secret which I read I think in 2020 it is a fun little like middle grade um 
fantasy adventure kind of based on Bengali mythology. Um, and I really loved book one. I think I gave it like four or five stars. Like I loved it. I love the characters. And since I read that, my friend Rue has actually gotten into the series and I think she's like finished the first series and now there's like a second series in the same like world. Um, and I think that she's been enjoying them like more and more and more. Um, and so I really want to get back to this. Um, and then for YA, I was looking at my YA shelf and I actually don't have that much unread YA on my shelves, but I just wanted like a very classic like fun YA that is not necessarily about trauma or anything. Like I just want cheesy YA goodness with like some romance, like possibly a love triangle. Like if I can have a love triangle, please and thank you. Um, and so I saw on my shelves that I have Force of Souls by Laurie M. Lee. This I got from, I'm pretty sure like Rue's unhaul pile. Yeah, I think I got this from Rue's unhaul pile um, when she unhauled like a bunch of books. Um, I have absolutely no idea what this is about, to be quite honest with you. Um, I just like the cover and I have not heard anybody talk about this book and the ratings on Goodreads are actually kind of terrible for this book. So honestly, I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious what I will think about this. Like if I read this synopsis, it tells me absolutely nothing, right? Like it just says, I have no family, no home, no talent other than, other than fighting. If I'm not to be the shadow, then I am nothing and I'm tired of being nothing. Like what does this even mean? Like what is this book about? So yeah, I'm a little intrigued. However, I am just taking a quick glance now and and I already see first person present tense. I'm rethinking this one, rethinking this one. But aside from that on audio, I'm probably gonna just continue on with my reread of A Dark Queen Rises by Asha K. Banker, just because again, I wanna like continue on. I really wanna finish th that series by the end of the year. Um, so I just wanna finish the second book so that I can get to the third book. And then on my e-reader, I have been reading like a number of different things, but I may or may not start this weekend, The Art of Prophecy um, by Wesley Chu. Um, this is to my knowledge, I don't really know much about it. I just know it's like wuxia and it's supposed to be like really fun. Um, and I am buddy reading this with Jesse from Bowties and Books. Um, and I think that they said they started it. And so I kind of feel like I should also start it. I guess, I suppose that would be what a buddy read entails. Um, I may or may not be starting that this weekend, but if not, maybe I'll find like a YA on my e-reader. Cause I know I have like a few YAs that I haven't like actually read yet. This is already a very chaotic start to a vlog as per fucking usual. So anyway, I'm gonna sign off now. I'm gonna go back to work and I will check in with you guys later. currently around noon. I have just ordered a burger for myself. I am just craving. I'm just craving some takeout. What can I say? Obviously last night I went to the HarperCollins event and I was... <laughs> I wanted to take more footage and stuff and like do like a cute little, you know, walking into the building moment, but I was ended up being late even though I left my house with like 20 extra minutes, like double the amount of time because it normally takes me 20 minutes to get downtown. <laughs> Um, but I forgot that the subway is closed near my house and then the bus never came, the, the one that was supposed to replace the subway. So I ended up having to like speed walk to the next nearest subway station that was open. And then by the time I got there, I was like late, I was sweaty, it was disgusting. It was just like, I was a mess, truly. Um, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, Tiffany D. Jackson was super cool. Like she talked about a lot of her inspirations behind The Weight of Blood, but also she just like chatted about like stuff she's watching these days. And like, she just seems like a lot of fun. 
and I really, really enjoyed hearing her speak, and I'm actually like really excited for The Weight of Blood now. I've never read a Tiffany D. Jackson book before, but um, this one definitely intrigued me. A, because like the reviews, the early reviews I've seen for it have all been quite positive, and also because I know it's partially inspired by um, this town in, I think, Georgia, she said, that only had its first uh, racially integrated prom, um, in 2014, which is like ridiculous. But also when I first heard of this book and I heard that that was one of the inspirations, it like unlocked a memory in me because I remember in high school, um, it would have been probably around 2010, 2009, somewhere around there. Um, there was a documentary made about a similar town in Mississippi and the documentary was called Prom Night in Mississippi. And it's like narrated by Morgan Freeman or something like that. But I remember this documentary distinctly because for some reason they came to my school before it came out and we got like an early preview of this documentary for some reason so everyone at my school watched it um and then also at the time because I was in this like race gender and rights class I also got to speak with the producers of the documentary and I thought it was like really cool it's just like one of those memories from high school that I like distinctly remember and so when I heard the premise it like reminded me of this other documentary that I'd seen it's a similar concept where um there's a town in Mississippi where at the time in 2009 or 2010 or whatever they had just had their first integrated prom and it was like so wild to me <laughs> to be quite honest when I walked it and I remember being like this is actually wild and then the fact that that continued on there are still probably towns in America um, that have racially segregated proms it's like ridiculous anyway um, all that to say I did pick up a couple of arcs while I was there um, it was such a nice event so thank you so much to HarperCollins for hosting it was like my first bookish event and it was so much fun and I like met a few people and I was like super awkward I'm sure but like everyone was really nice um but let me walk you through the arcs I got obviously first and foremost I got The Weight of Blood by Tiffany D. Jackson it is signed and personalized so very exciting I'm very excited to read this I think I'm going to read this in October I know people are like it's September it's spooky season but like listen I'm a wimp and it's not spooky season for me yet though actually I do have like a potential project for spooky season this year I did do a spooky vlog last year um where I was like dabbling in spooky books for the first time maybe I'll read this like either just before October or just after I don't know but I'm definitely gonna be reading it soon-ish the second book I picked up is Fiddle Punk Bruja which I've never really heard anyone talk about I've never even heard of it before like last week <laughs> basically but it is one of the um Libro FM picks for this month and it's kind of the only one that I was like vaguely interested in this month um so I did download it and so because I saw it I was like maybe I'll just pick up a physical copy for myself to read along with all I really know about it um is that it is a historical fantasy and the main character is a white passing um Latina woman um in the 20s I don't really know much else about it other than that it is a historical fantasy um but it sounds interesting and like i said i like that i have both the audiobook and the physical now so i'm happy to have a copy of this also the cover is like quite pretty um and then the last book i picked up is all that's left and said um this is a contemporary it's not literary i don't think i think it's technically classed as contemporary and i've seen this quite a lot on um instagram i feel like it's really interesting now that i am on instagram i'm not like fully on instagram but i am on it sometimes how different the books that are hyped on Instagram compared to um, booktube are. And I think partially it's because this book got like a whole PR package, I'm pretty sure. And I've been seeing it all over my Instagram timeline, but I've not seen a single booktuber receive any of these PR boxes. So I th thought that was really interesting. But anyway, I was like, I'm just gonna pick it up because it's by an Asian author. I think she's Australian. Yeah, she's Australian. All I really know about the premise of this book is that it is about a woman whose brother was murdered and then she goes back to her hometown um, to deal with the death of her brother and then also she's trying to like figure out what happened and like it's meant to be like an exploration of like grief and like family and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, very intrigued to read this next time in the, I'm in the mood for like a contemporary. I don't know. I think this might be out already. If not, it's coming out sometime this month. But that is my mini HarperCollins haul from the event last night. I do have updates on Ruination. Um, I'm currently on page 275. 
Um, so I only have about 125 pages of this left. Um, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm on part three now. Part two, I will say I was not enjoying quite as much as part one. Um, I feel like, did I give a summary of this? I know I summarized it in my last vlog, but very quickly, a summary of this is that our main character is Callista. Like, we do have a couple of other POVs, but I would say our main character is Callista. She is the niece to the king, and he is kind of like unhinged. Like, he's not very good at his job. But basically, there's an assassination attempt on him, and then his wife ended up being poisoned from that, um, and she's like, on her deathbed basically and there is this like rumor of something called the well of ages i believe it's called um and it's rumored that the water from this well can cure any illness and so um viego the king sends callista on this journey to go find the blessed isles which are this these mysterious isles that nobody knows if they exist or not um so part one is kind of the setup of the book and then part two is her going to find the blessed isles and this like mysterious well she doesn't actually even know if it exists or not um so part two to be honest i thought i would enjoy a lot more because i thought i would enjoy the whole like blessed isle situation a lot more than i actually did but i think the main thing is that in part two we get introduced to a new character called rise riza i don't really know um and i just don't really like his pov and so like i was bored by all of his kind of pov moments um and we don't get as much callista as I would have hoped. Um, but part three, we return back to the palace. And so I am excited because I'm very invested in what happens in this court. Listen, the court politics are not super, you know, intricate or anything like that, but it's just like a fun time. Also, there is this like side romance that I am way too invested in, to be quite honest with you. Like it's, it's been the most like, minor minor subplot but like I'm just so invested in this relationship okay I love a good friends to lovers moment so like I just love it anyway um I think I'm gonna finish this today like I think I can finish it today so I think I'm going to just be reading this for the rest of the day I'm gonna obviously have my burger when it arrives um but I will check in with you once I finish Ruination or if I've made any progress on any of the other books that I plan on reading and I will see you at the next check-in hello friends it is currently 6 56 p.m and I've just woken up from a two-hour nap I'm really not sure. I really don't know what century I've woken up in. Um, but I wanted to check in because before I took a nap, I finished Ruination by Anthony Reynolds. And I ended up giving this 3.5 stars, which I think is a really good rating. Okay, okay, I, I need to, I feel the need to justify my rating system again. Because sometimes I rate things like three, three and a half stars and people will be like, you didn't like the book. I thought you were enjoying it. And I'm like, I do enjoy it. I don't know what you're talking about. A three star book is a good book. It is a book that I would recommend to people. It is a book I may or may not reread. A 3.5 is like firmly in the like, I would reread this book category, like, in the right time and in the right space. A four-star book is, like, a favorite book. And then a five-star book is, like, a favorite, favorite book. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I gave this 3.5 stars anyway. I did round it down to a three on Goodreads, though, because I just don't feel like it's quite got that, like four star feel you know I will say that the last third of this book is extremely explosive the climax of this book is very very good like I feel like it's well executed I just ultimately feel like you know like this isn't a book again that I will be like remembering for the rest of my life you know I'm not like super attached to any of these characters I just thought this was like a really really great palette cleanser fantasy and like for what it is I really really enjoyed it but I don't think it's like anything special you know what I mean like if you don't decide to pick up Ruination I don't think you'd be missing out on much but I also feel like if you do decide to pick it up you're not gonna have a bad time that's kind of how I feel about it and I think 3.5 stars is the perfect rating anyway I don't know why I'm like so heavily justifying this <laughs> I think it's because I just like I feel very like self-conscious about my rating system sometimes anyway um back to what I actually thought about the book though um it very much reads like a prequel I don't actually know if it is or not like I don't know where in the universe in the League of Legends lore this book fits in but to me it reads like a prequel the way that everything ends the way that like certain storylines and character arcs end feels like a prequel to me
ultimately, at the end of the day, this was just a really fun time. I think I'm going to move on. I don't know what I'm going to move on to because now I'm kind of in the mood for fantasy, but I also like really need to um, get on with School for Good Mothers, which I started in my last vlog. I haven't made any progress since, but I really need to continue on. But I'm not really in the mood to read anything that like I need to annotate. And that book is definitely a book that I annotate. Maybe I'll start a middle grade. Maybe I'll start a YA. Who's to say? Who's to say? But once I start another book and I have some thoughts, I will check in with you. I don't know if that's going to be tomorrow or like the day after, unsure, because I also want to play my video game a little bit. But anyway, those were my final thoughts on Ruination, and I will see you at the next check-in. Good morning, friends. Happy Tuesday. I did not check in yesterday at all. I didn't really do anything yesterday. I was not feeling well, so I took the day off work, and I basically just slept most of the day. Um, but the times in which I wasn't sleeping, I actually finished a book. Um, I started on Sunday night the audiobook for Blood Like Magic by Lizelle Sambury. This is a YA I've had my eye on for a while because the author, I think, lives in Toronto or like in the Toronto area. Um, and she is Trinidadian Canadian. And so I've been like very intrigued by this book again because it's by a Torontonian author. And I know that the book takes place in Toronto. And while I've seen it like all over the place here, like in stores and stuff, I think because she is a local author, I haven't seen anybody talk about it on booktube really. Um, maybe like a couple of people here and there, but like it's really not gotten a lot of hype. But I'm here to tell you that booktube is missing out. This book is fucking incredible. I love this book so much. Um, I gave it 4.5 stars in the end. It's not perfect. And I think that a lot of people will have issues with the writing, um, which is mainly what I had an issue with. But the story itself is so good. The characters are so good. The themes are so good. I loved this book. Okay, let me backtrack because I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> what is Blood Like Magic about? We follow our main character, Voya, who has just turned 16, and she comes from a family of witches. And in their family, like in their culture, when you get your period, that is when your magic starts basically and then you have to go through something called the calling in which you connect with one of your ancestors and they give you a task and then you do the task and then if you pass then you get magic and you get um a specific power that is bestowed upon you by your ancestor and that's kind of how their magic works in their family there's a lot of things going on in this book um i will say it's sold as like an urban fantasy but it's actually like very much a sci fantasy um in that like yes there's magic obviously there are witches and whatnot but the world that it takes place in is actually in the future i believe it's 2030 is is like the actual year but it takes place in a future version of toronto and there's a lot of like technology and like biotech elements to the story because what ends up happening is that voya fails her calling and she begs her ancestor for a second chance what ends up happening is that she's given a second chance and if she fails again then her entire family will lose magic which is obviously a big deal a because it's a huge part of their identity of their culture but also because their entire livelihood depends on their magic like their entire business there they own like um like a beauty care business and so like their products are infused with like their magic and like they need their magic in order to run their business and there's other things going on as well that make this like much more high stakes but like I don't want to spoil too much but basically Voya has her entire family's like future in her hands so she embarks on this like second chance um at redeeming herself and what she has to do is that she has to destroy her first love that is the quest and so she's like I gotta kill a boy that I don't even know I'm in love with yet because she's like I don't love anyone so what she ends up doing is that she's like you know what I'm gonna use my brain cells I am going to find my genetic match so she goes to this like a company called New Gene which is like a biotech company um and they are running this like match situation like a genetic match test um and she is part of that program and so she finds her genetic match um and she's like what better way to fall in love than with my genetic match and so she now has to like fall in love with this guy and then like kill him within a month basically and that's kind of like the setup of the story it's so much fun it's such a great blend of like sci-fi and fantasy i love this book so much and i think despite my issues with some of the writing and stuff like that, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later, I feel like 
this book ultimately is like everything that I feel like I've been missing from YA recently in recent years not just like this like recent months like in recent years and I think that there have been like multiple conversations in the community about whether or not YA is still written for teenagers or whether it's more written for adults now and it is a problem it's definitely a problem I'll link below um Ashley at Bookish Realm she did a video recently where she talks about that a little bit um but I'll link her video down below if you're interested in more of like a discussion video about that specifically like I'm not I'm not equipped to talk about it so I'm not going to go into it but there is definitely like an issue I think with a lot of YA not actually being written for teenagers and fundamentally I just love this book because it genuinely feels like it was written for a teenager. One of my big issues with YA is that like we're the fucking adults like there's never any fucking adults and these like teenagers are just running rampant and I'm like please like Parents, where are you? Family, where are you? And I feel like this book, like, absolutely fixes that. Like, as someone who, like, grew up pretty much exclusively, like, hanging out with my family, like, I didn't really hang out with friends outside of school. Like, that wasn't a thing that my family did. Like, outside of school, you hung out with your family. That's just what you did. And so, like, this book was so relatable to me in that sense. And also, Voya as a main character is just so relatable to me, okay? Like, she, one of her main, like, flaws as a human being is that she is incapable of making decisions. And that's, like, kind of how this whole thing comes about because she doesn't know how to make a decision. She doesn't know how to decide what to do. And that's how she, like, fell into this mess. Um, but... I just like as as a very very indecisive person I relate to that a lot. I find committing to a decision very difficult and so like I just related to her a lot. I think that her relationship with like her cousins was like so relatable to me like as again as someone who was like really close with my cousins grew up with all my cousins and like I didn't live with my cousins and like my whole extended family like all year round but like every single summer like we would all go back to Hong Kong and we all lived in like a three bedroom apartment like 15 of us or something ridiculous like that in like a three bedroom apartment and I feel like it's like it's just so there's so much about her and her family that just like reminded me of my own you know despite like the difference in culture it's just like reminded me a lot of my family and I just really really enjoyed the family aspect of this book I also really enjoyed the themes in general I feel like the themes were all really well executed and I think specifically were really well executed and geared towards um a younger kind of teen audience like I feel like all of the themes were like very accessible um but you weren't really like beat over the head with them either like they were just presented in a way that a didn't undermine like the severity of them but also like wasn't relentlessly like traumatizing you know I think of other books that deal with these kind of like really complicated themes and, and these like really traumatic themes of like racism and intergenerational trauma and I feel like a lot of YAs that I've read recently that deal with these types of themes are just very relentless and like almost too traumatic in a way that like I feel like doesn't offer a young person with much hope Granted, like, not all literature needs to offer hope or whatnot, but I feel like if you're writing towards a teenager, like, that is something to be considerate of. You know, like, as an adult, like, I'll read really depressing fiction and I'll be okay with it because, like, I'm already jaded by the world, but, like, I would like to hope that, like, young teens reading fiction won't become jaded because of the fiction they read. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like the world is already depressing enough. If they're gonna become, like, disillusioned by the world, it should be by the world itself and not by the fiction that they're reading to escape the world. You know what I'm saying? And so I feel like this book offers a sense of hope and without trivializing the themes and the topics at hand, if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense. I will say the one only thing that I feel like was kind of brushed over was um, one of the characters has an eating disorder and that was kind of brushed over and I don't know if I like that very much, but it is the first book in a uh, duology. So hopefully we get to address that a little bit more in book two, I'm hoping. Another thing that I feel like I'm just really biased towards this book because I feel like I love books set in Toronto. Like, I know that Toronto is not perfect. Like, this is not a perfect city by any means. But, like, I live here for a reason, okay? Like, I love my city. And I feel like when you read Blood Like Magic, the Toronto you see through 
the author's lens is the Toronto that I see. When I read the book, I was like, this is exactly how I see my city as well. Like, and this is like why I live here. And this is why I call this my home, despite some of the issues, despite some of the flaws of the city. And even that, I feel like the flaws were depicted in the book. And so like, I just feel like Lizelle Sambury just like painted a perfect picture of what living in Toronto is like. It was so fucking good. And I just love seeing like my neighborhoods and like my like, local haunts and it was so funny because she mentioned P-Mall at one point and she was like P-Mall like if you didn't know what P like Pacific Mall is it's like an Asian super center and I'm like that's exactly what it is it's exactly exactly what it is um <laughs> and like I never thought I would read a P-Mall reference in a book before but here we are. Anyway, obviously I highly recommend this book. I would say that if you love family stories if you okay this is like a weird comp but like if you watch Turning Red and you specifically really liked the um, like family aspect and the warm, fuzzy family feels that that gave you, I think you will really enjoy this story. Because while obviously very different stories, very different cultures, very different families, I feel like Voya's family gave me those same warm, fuzzy family feels. You know what I'm saying? And so I feel like if you like that aspect of Turning Red, I think you would really like Blood Like Magic. In general, I think if you like sci fantasy, if you are into kind of like um, unique concepts, I think that Blood Like Magic will offer a lot for you. I think, again, my only critique of this book is that the writing is a little not the best. Um, it is a debut though, so I do feel like I do offer more leeway in terms of how much it bothers me. Like it was really repetitive at times. Like I do feel like she reuses descriptive words a lot and she reuses metaphors quite a bit as well. And at times it can kind of take you out of the story a little bit, but it wasn't too bad. It was strangely enough written in first person present tense and I didn't hate it. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that it's like a 500 page book and like a 16 hour audiobook, and it is is a little too long. There were definitely moments where I was like, this definitely could have been cut out or like edited down. I don't know. Um, so I think that if you look at like negative reviews of this book or even just like positive reviews as well, like that is a common critique that the book is a little too long. And I completely agree with that. Like I do think it's a little, it's a little wordy. Um, but if you can look past that, I think that the story has so much heart. It has so much like... <laughs> Oh, I just loved it. I loved it so much. Um, a little rant though about the narrator, the audiobook narrator. So this is narrated by Jonice Abbott Pratt, whom I have only read one other book by, um, and that was Ray Bearer. And across these two books now, I actually don't mind her narration. I think that as in general, I quite like her narration. The only problem is across these two books now, there have been pronunciation issues. And I'm just like, ma'am, please, can you get it together? Like, is this not your job to figure out pronunciations before you start narrating a book? Like, it wasn't as bad in this book as it was in Ray Bearer, because in Ray Bearer, she just completely butchers, like, Korean words. And granted, I don't speak Korean, but, like, I have watched and consumed enough Korean media my entire life to know that certain words are not pronounced the way that she pronounces them in the audiobook. And, like, in Ray Bearer, it's even worse, because Jordan Ifueko actually literally has, like, a pronunciation guide in the back and she doesn't even pronounce the words according to the pronunciation guide so it's just like I don't understand but in this book specifically it really <laughs> bothered me to be quite honest and I don't think anyone who is not Canadian will notice this or even if you are Canadian you might not notice this because like maybe it just doesn't bother you as much as it does me but she would pronounce certain words the American way and not the Canadian way and it super irritated me because like again this book takes place so firmly in Toronto like this is very clearly like a Trinidadian Canadian family and she grew up in Canada she was born and raised in Canada like there is no reason why this girl would have an American accent, okay? Um, and pronounce words the American way. And again, because it's in first person point of view, like every time a word would be pronounced like the wrong way, like in, according to me, the wrong way, I'd be like, it would literally just take me out of the story. The one that really bothered me the most was the word foyer, because like Americans say foyer apparently. So every time she would say foyer, I was like, ma'am, Come on. Like, I feel like this is a very commonly known one as well, like where it's like Canadians say foyer and Americans say foyer. And it's just like, it's not pronounced foyer here. Like, it's just not. I, like, I just, it really irritated me. And the other one that I distinctly remember is she pronounced instead of Ben Marie, Voya is a baker. Um, and so she needed a Ben Marie to like melt the chocolate or whatever. And she said Bain Marie. And I was like, 
please. Like, I beg. Like, <laughs> save me from this bad pronunciation. Like, I, I don't know. Like, it just really irritates me. It just really bothers me when audiobook narrators, like, don't work out pronunciations before they actually, like, do the book. Like, another example of this is um, We Hunt the Flame, that audiobook. Fiona Hardingham. She just like changes pronunciations of words like uh, left, right and center, left, right and center. It's so freaking annoying. It's so freaking annoying. Like work it out before you go into the audiobook, please. Anyway, that is my rant on audiobook narrators and in particular the pronunciation of some of the words in this one. But anyway, I've talked long enough. I also started The Art of Prophecy, but I'm not that far into it. So I will check in with you probably tomorrow or like later today when I have updates on that. And I will see you at the next check-in. Hello friends, happy Wednesday. I feel like this week is going by so slowly. And I don't know if it's because I wasn't feeling well on Monday and I took it off, but like, I just, like, I feel like it should be at least Thursday already, but it's only Wednesday. Um, I do have like a quick reading update, nothing crazy. Um, I started Blood Like Fate last night, um, which is the second book in the Blood Like Magic duology. Um, this is like the first time in a really long time that I've actually like, binge read a series like I've been trying to do it and I just like haven't been compelled to but this story like I don't know if it's just because maybe like I'm reading this series on audio versus the other series I've been trying to binge read have been like physical reads so I don't know I don't know but um I'm really enjoying it I'm already about 30 percent just over 30 percent into it so like about a third of the way through the book um still really enjoying it I feel like the way book one left off I really wasn't sure where we were gonna go in book two um um, but I'm pleasantly surprised at the direction we're taking. Like, I feel like we are truly, like, dealing with the consequences of, like, what happened in book one. Um, I feel like um, Voya, our main character, she definitely has a lot of growing to do. But then again, she's only a 16-year-old girl who's, like, suddenly had, like, so much responsibility, like, thrust on her shoulders. And I feel like we're adequately, like, dealing with that. And I hope that we can see her have some sort of, like, meaningful and significant growth. I just feel like she's a really great main character. I feel like she's a great balance between like idealist and like pragmatic. Like she is idealist in the sense that like, yes, she's like, you know, she wants to get this community together and she wants, you know, all these like grand, wonderful things, but also like there's a practical reason to that as well. And like, she wants to do these things Yes, because she feels like it'll bring back her community, it'll bring back her family, but like, she also just needs to do them because like if she doesn't like there's no better way to do it than this way. I like that there's like a bit of a balance there. Um, I know I mentioned in the first book one thing I wasn't a big fan of is how they just brushed over the eating disorder for one of the side characters and they are addressing it more in this book actually. So I'm glad to see that. That being said like it's not something that I personally have lived experience with and so like I don't know ultimately like how respectfully done it is. So I'll definitely be looking for reviews to see um, if anyone has comments on like how it's done. I do also want to mention, I don't think I mentioned this for the first book, but it is very like queer normative. Like there are just like queer characters in the story. Um, and if you are looking for more asexual representation, one of the characters is demisexual as well. I originally was planning yesterday to go after work and walk to the bookstore and see if I could pick myself up a copy of the box set, even though I don't need the box set, okay? I definitely think this is a series that I prefer on audio, but like, I still want the box set. I really love this series. I want, <laughs> I want physical books. Um, so I'm gonna go see if they have it. I don't know, like I, I really want it, but also the box set is a hardcover box set and it's not any cheaper than buying two hardcovers separately, which kind of annoys me, but sometimes Indigo does do discounts on box sets um like in store so I'm gonna go see if they have it there um and I'm also gonna go see if they have a copy of Nona because I also want to pick up a physical copy of Nona because that released yesterday so hopefully I will do that today after work anyway that's it for this check-in and I will see you at the next one Hello friends, happy Friday. I don't think I've checked in since like Wednesday maybe, um, but I thought I would do one final check-in. I don't actually remember when I started this vlog exactly, but here we are. Um, 
I did finish Blood Like Fate yesterday, so I've officially finished an entire duology in the course of this vlog, I believe. Um, and I really liked it. I gave it four stars in the end. I don't think I liked it quite as much as the first book. I think the plot ultimately is not as strong as in the first book, um, because it really is just like dealing with the repercussions of the first book, but I just don't know if it needed to be this long. To be quite honest, that's my main critique of the entire series is that there is just a lot of filler. Um, and I think the series could have been like a duology with two kind of like 350 page books instead of like, I think each book is like almost 500 pages, which is like quite chunky. Um, and I just, I'm not, I'm not sure each book needed to be this long. But overall, I really did enjoy book two. And I think the duology as a whole for me is like a four star duology. Like it is a favorite of this year for sure. Like it's definitely I think the best YA I've read this year. Um, but is it an all time favorite? I'd have to reread to tell like I don't think it's like, like when I read, for example, We Hunt the Flame last year, I knew instantly I was like, this is an all time favorite series. Like, you know, but I don't feel that way about Blood Like Fate. I had a lot of fun with it. I would absolutely recommend everyone to read it, but I don't know if it's like an all time favorite just yet, but I absolutely wanna reread it and I absolutely will be checking out what Lizelle Sambury writes next. I just, I really ultimately loved the themes. Again, I think it's the same kind of themes as we saw in book one with the family, the community, um, but just expanded. And I think I really liked how in book two, we expanded to kind of building the community. There's a lot of conversation in the book about moving past like old grudges and old rivalries and trying to move forward and creating a sense of community and a safe space for everyone to partake in. And I think that there's something to be said about like a YA book with such a positive and like hopeful message while not downplaying you know perhaps kind of the more complicated history behind some of these like community dynamics. I want to make super clear that I think that this series is a great YA series specifically. I think it is great for young people, which I cannot say for a lot of <laughs> young adult books, to be quite honest with you. And I think that this series is just so fantastic for young adults. And I think that, I mean, as an adult, I enjoyed it, but I think some of the messaging and the like lessons to be learned is like so important for young adults. And I think, and one thing that I personally really appreciate is the focus on platonic love, um, because I think that oftentimes in media, we see this like intense focus and even in society, to be honest, but media is obviously like an extension of society. But there's this like weird mentality I feel around like, if you don't have like a romantic partner for life, then you will die lonely. And I just I hate that. I hate that because like as someone who doesn't really care that much about romantic love. Like I just don't like I appreciate romance and romantic love for what it is. But for me, m the most important relationships in my life have always been family and friends. And I have always thought that like, family and friends and your platonic love towards your family and friends is, has always for me been more important to me than like romantic relationships. And I just feel like more media should emphasize that and I feel like especially more media that is directed and targeted towards young people should express that because I think it is so important for young people to like not be indoctrinated with this like stupid idea. I just feel like this is one of those books where I can't speak about it coherently because like I just like so fundamentally like feel like I it's it's saying so many things that I want to say and like also that it just like it just has so much heart it's so I don't know I just really love it I think you should all read it and like before I make a fool of myself I'm just gonna end it here <laughs> um I didn't really read anything after I finished that I tried to start three kingdoms again but like I'm not in the mood for a classic I don't know what I'm in the mood for to be quite honest with you I also like just try to like read a chapter of all the books that I currently have like open um but nothing's really sticking so I think I might just like game this weekend um but yeah anyway that is it for this vlog it's probably really long I feel like it is um and I apologize for that if you stuck around to the end as always I super super appreciate it if you like this video please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and comment down below if you can't think of anything leave me 
a pumpkin emoji because it's officially pumpkin spice season and I don't care what anyone says about it. I fucking love pumpkin spice. And if you like this video and you want to see more from me, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. That is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all next time.